Thank you. So to start out, I just want to say a few words about our organization, Veterans for Peace. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, we're a global organization uh, with over 100 chapters in the U.S., but also with chapters overseas in Vietnam and uh, a, ch a newly formed chapter in the U.K., in Britain, of uh, British soldiers who were veterans of uh, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, within the United States, we have thousands of members. Um, as you can see, not all of us are veterans of um, the United States military, but we all share uh, the same things, and that is to increase the public's awareness of the cost of war. Uh, too often you just see the newspaper and you don't think not only what it costs the soldiers fighting or the civilians who are impacted by bombs falling on their homes, but what it takes out of our own communities. Uh, we also want to abolish war as an instrument in national policy and stop our government from intervening either overtly or covertly in the affairs of other countries. And lastly, we seek justice, justice particularly for veterans and the victims of war. And all those um, general organizational concepts tie in with some of our initiatives. Uh, besides this, the Iran Working Group, we have uh, the Iraq Water Project, um, mm. which um, raises funds to provide uh, water filtration equipment for uh, communities in Iraq who might have had it before our country bombed uh, and actually targeted water purification plants there. We have a Korea peace campaign where we support um, the Korean people uh, in their struggle to unify their country and um, support struggles, particularly in South Korea, against taking a pristine island that should be a, really a national park and turning it into a bombing, uh, bombing range and gunnery range. Uh, we have our Vietnam Agent Orange Relief and Responsibility Campaign, which takes into account our own veterans as well as the people of Vietnam. Uh, we have veterans peace teams that attempt to intervene um, you know, in demonstrations and, and to put ourselves between the police and demonstrators. So. The brutality, we actually just recently saw an ongoing in Turkey. Uh, we do what we can to see that doesn't happen here. Sometimes successful, sometimes unsuccessful. Uh, and lastly, I saw somebody with an SOA t-shirt. We take part in, um, in the School of the Americas Watch and um, related uh, solidarity with Latin America. Uh, specifically myself, our chapter uh, in northern New Jersey has um, encouraged me and I went twice to Honduras in support of uh, the people in Honduras struggling for their democratic rights. So that's kind of um, an overview of what we do. And um, today we're focused on Iran and um, Iran is a target. And for me, it was, um, I did a little research um, to see exactly what we're using to target Iran. And um, they're, they're, they're the political weapons. And most recently, our senator here in New Jersey, Robert Menendez, um, oh, yes. came up with a resolution uh, in the United States Senate that really is a blueprint for war. And um, it was passed by the overwhelming majority of the Senate. Um, it says, well, if Israel's going to attack uh, Iran, the US will support that attack unconditionally. Um, however, we know that um, those of you who have dogs know the tail doesn't wag the dog, the dog wags the tail. <laughs> so that um, if Israel were to attack Iran, they would never do it on their own. They could not do it on their own. But um, I, 
think we, one of the things we have to do is demystify to some extent what's actually out there in uh, the Persian Gulf. Um, you know, um, number of ships floating around, and they all belong to the Fifth Fleet. And um, for the sailors aboard, um, it's not that they're anchored in this uh, tropical or semi-tropical area, they're on deck putting on sunscreen and listening to music. No, it's not like that at all. Um, these ships are at um, battle stations most of the time. And um, for the Iranian people who face the same problems we do, I mean, they, whatever question we, we face as a, as a community in Sparta, in New Jersey, in the United States, whether it's questions of peace, whether it's questions of our environment, whether it's questions of uh, LGBTQ equality, all the questions we face, um, the Iranian people face and trying to deal with it, except they are dealing with it and trying to deal with it with a gun pointed at their head and a bullet in the chamber and the safety off and a finger on the trigger. And um, to, to, to like make that, uh, those terms real, I just want to uh, go over um, what, what the uh, Obama administration has deployed hmm. in the Persian Gulf as of February 24th. Those are the, 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 those are the statistics that I was able to get. First, you have an aircraft carrier. And um, the USS George Washington, with a crew of over 5,000 sailors, f actually 5,500 sailors. And just think what that costs to run every hour and, and how we could use that money at mm. home. Mm. And on that aircraft carrier are, um, well, they have what they call squadrons. There's a squadron of F-14 fighters. There's another squadron of F-18 fighters. There's a third squadron of another 12 F-18 fighters. Then the Marine Corps has their strike fighters, has, has 10 F-18 strike fighters there. Then there are 14 aircraft called EA-6Bs that do electronic warfare. Uh, they have larger crews. Um, then there are early warning uh, aircraft, that, that there are four of those. Then there are helicopters, four helicopters. Then there's another squadron dealing with sea control. Then there's a squadron dealing with logistics. And then there's another aircraft carrier, the USS Independence also with a crew of 5,000. Oh. And they have a similar makeup. Those, although you put all those aircraft together, they're called an air wing. So I found out that air wing number one in the United States Navy is aboard the USS George Washington. Air wing number five, similar makeup. <coughs> Almost 100 planes and crew and mechanics and fuel to fuel them and weapons. Aircraft wing number five is aboard the USS Independence. And these air wings have laser-guided bombs, missiles, and all kinds of weapons. Then there's some cruisers that are going along with the aircraft carriers. So we have the USS Bunker Hill with Tomahawk missiles, 360 crew members. We have the USS Normandy, 360 crew members. All these ships moving around at battle stations right off the coast of Iran. We also have destroyers. There's the USS Barry, 300 in, uh, sailors. The USS Kearney, the USS Ingersoll, the USS John McCain. Oh. <laughs> I, he winds up everywhere. Actually, the father. The, father. Yeah, oh. the USS John Young. <laughs> Then we have guided missile frigates, the USS Reuben James, the USS Samuel Roberts, the USS Ingersoll. 
<laughs> for the Iranian people to, to be on their coasts, maybe they're going to the beach, um, and they see this yeah. in so-called international waters. <laughs> I mean, you have to be, you're going to be, what would it do when you see this all the time? There were also attack submarines. Uh, February 24th, there were two. There was the USS Annapolis and the USS Charlotte. And you can only imagine the weapons there carry. There were also what's called fast combat support ships. There were three on February 24th. It's done. It's sorry. So sorry. Stations, you know. <laughs> So sorry. Um, there was the USS Seattle, the USS Samuel B. Roberts, the USS Ingersoll. Each of those ships have, you know, four or five hundred sailors. There are mine countermeasure ships, the USS Arden, the USS Dextrous. So once again, this is a gun pointed at the Iranian people. And, and to, to their credit, um, they haven't flinched. I mean, you know, they haven't done something that would lead these ships to just open up. Then there's also what's called the USS Guam Amphibious Ready Group. Uh, that's a ship with a crew of 900 plus 2,000 combat marines uh, on board, plus six Super Cobra attack helicopters, plus cargo hel 12 cargo helicopters, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also the USS Shreveport, an amphibious transport, and the USS Ashland, and the USS Oak Hill, which are dock landing ships. You know, maybe somebody who's experienced within the Navy could tell us what they do. But anyway, this is what is right off the coast of Iran in the Persian Gulf, which is a relatively narrow body of water. And you know, going over this, I, c I could only think, I, I know the Pentagon has plans, has its war plans. So what's the plan if the Iranians, if something broke out and one of these mega aircraft carriers was hit and disabled and it has nuclear reactors as, to power it and it has all these nuclear weapons on board? What happens? You know, what, what, what happens in that case? So this is something scary. It's scary for the Iranians. For me, reading about it, it was scary for me. Um, so that's the Navy. But now what about the Air Force? Well, the Air Force has over 8,000 um, personnel stationed in the area with over 100 aircraft. And then there are aircraft on the ready here in the US. Uh, B-1 bombers uh, based out in Missouri, ready to, for a moment's notice, take off. Um, and the aircraft operate out of Kuwait, uh, Turkey, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia. And lastly, there are over 7,000 U.S. Army combat ground troops, uh, mostly based at Camp Doha in Kuwait. So this is what is pointed at the Iranians, and, and this is something that just to run this machine costs, mm. is, I'm sure, a billion dollars a, a week, if not a, a day. I mean, the amount of fuel used, uh, all this. And um, meanwhile, you know, you go, I live in Jersey City, our schools, um, school programs being cut, and it, 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 it the money is just going from the schools in Jersey City out to the Persian Gulf to keep this armada uh, moving. Um, and a little bit of how this armada actually does uh, move around. From May 6th to May 30th, they were in an exercise. And the exercise is called the International Mine Countermeasures Exercise of 2013, which had over 40 nations take part, once again, right off the coast of Iran. And um, this went on for weeks. And these, um, these, the, this exercise was not passive. Mm. Planes taking off all the time, landing all the time. 
ships doing combat maneuvers, submarines coming up, coming down, uh, missiles going into, you know, into the, um, the launch platform, and then, you know, withdrawing. But all this, this is what the Iranian people face every day. And um, there was, I, I took a look at um, the uh, website of the Fifth Fleet. And you really see the propaganda. I mean, whoever reads this, but I think a lot of the sailors, you know, who, who are our children and relatives and neighbors who, who can't find jobs here and, you know, end up in the Navy. Um, there was something called from a guided missile cruiser, the USS Monterey, something called a VBSS mission. What's a VBSS mission? Visit, board, search, and seizure. And it was an article written by um, Billy Ho, a communications specialist, third class, who wrote about um, a VBSS mission that made contact with the Dow. And uh, the Dow, D-H-O-W, is a very um, traditional uh, vessel that plies those waters. It has sails, mostly it may have a small engine if you know, the wind dies down. And um, they, boarded, uh, they boarded a Dow. And um, in the uh, press release, um, the uh, officer in charge said, we had no suspicions that anything out of the ordinary was occurring on the vessel. We were simply conducting our mission of building positive relationships with local fishers. <laughs> we want to make sure they understand we are here to help oh, and that we are available if they need assistance. After making initial contact, the master of the Dow, the captain, invited the team to board his vessel. I mean, did he have a choice? <laughs> you know, you're in a fishing boat and this boat loaded to uh, the gunwales comes up and says, we want to board, are you going to say no? So um, this is sort of a picture um, of what's going on in uh, right off the coast of Iran. And um, we have a history with Iran and the history, I, I think, for us will go into includes not only what's going on right now, but 1953, the overthrow of the pro elected prime minister, Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh, uh, and then from 1953 to 1979, uh, support of the Shah's um, vicious regime. I want to just uh, conclude by, by saying a few words about Israel. Um, I lived in Israel for close to five years. I grew up in New York City. Um, I went to school in New York City. Uh, how I ended up in Israel is a whole other story, but it's a story shared uh, by a lot of people with my background uh, coming out of the Jewish community. Um, the reality of Israel is that it couldn't exist for more than a month without the massive U.S. financial, political, and military assistance it receives. And a lot of financial assistance, um, overt, covert, uh, tax-related, so you can donate and not you know, have to pay taxes on it, um, what it does is it bolsters up the standard of living in Israel so that relative to the surrounding areas, it's pretty high. Like, you know, I mean, there are uh, issues of, um, you know, just like here. Some people have more, some people have less. But a lot of people, there's, there's a strong middle class. People have HD TVs, they have cable TV, internet. They can travel uh, once a year overseas, they go to Europe, they come here, they can send their kids to school here. And this, this relatively high standard of living is, is artificially propped up by the U.S. by USAID. And, and without that aid, um, 
it's my feeling shared by a lot of people that you know in a month the whole the whole thing would collapse um, in in a way that people would want to leave. I mean, they, they, a lot of people would leave a lot, but a lot of people would stay too. Um, and Israel does not make any ind independent decisions um, as far as um, Israel attacking Iran. That that would only be done under uh, the direction of today would be the Obama administration through the Pentagon and, and through the State Department. So um, I am though optimistic, especially when I look at everybody here um, with, every, with all the issues with Iran, um, I'm sure if we took five people uh, from this audience and sent them to Iran, I think in less than 24 <laughs> hours, the people, the, the government of Iran, the government here would have no further issues. Um, it's just people who have war on their minds, and, and war is profitable. Um, if war breaks out, every missile, every bullet fired has to be replenished, which means profits for um, the war industries. So thank you very much um, for inviting us here. And uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Faraz and Michael. Thank you, Michael.